wonderful day coming up on One Norway Street. Welcome to One Norway Street. I'm Skylar Sackett. Today, powerful days, unforgettable images of the civil rights movement by life photographer Charles Moore. Plus, art treasures from the National Museum of Kuwait, jewels, porcelains, and manuscripts which were saved from the Iraqi invasion. But first, we continue our series on nations of the Middle East with a focus on Egypt. No country in the world has a longer or more majestic history than the land along the Lower Nile. The memory of the ancient pharaohs is still very much alive in modern Egypt, as well as memories of centuries when Cairo was the hub of Islamic civilization, a cosmopolitan center of art and learning. In the modern era, Egypt's position in the Arab world has fluctuated widely, from the time when President Gamal Nasser led the cause of Arab nationalism in the 1950s to the isolation that followed Egypt's separate peace with Israel at Camp David in 1979. Today, Egypt's moderate position is once more under fire as President Hosni Mubarak gives strong support to the UN coalition in the Gulf. We're joined by two Egyptian guests. Nazli Shukri is a professor of political science at MIT. Professor Farouk El Baz is director of the Boston University Center for Remote Sensing. Welcome both of you to One Norway Street. Thank you. Professor Elbaz, how risky is it for President Mubarak and Egypt, Egypt's leaders in general to, to support the United Nations position in the Gulf? I don't think it is uh, very risky at all because uh, Egyptian uh, position is basically in support of all Arab countries and the legitimacy that is international. And uh, so I don't really think the, the position is shaky at all. I think most of the population of Egypt supports the position of uh, President Hosni Mubarak in making certain that the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait ends and the protection of Saudi Arabia. Professor Shukri, would you agree that it's not risky for, for President Mubarak to, su to support the United Nations position? After all, there have been threats of terrorism which are frightening people in the United States. Even uh, a lot closer. I'm a political scientist and I see problems everywhere. Every political position everywhere is always risky. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Abbas is more optimistic than I am, but there are always risks everywhere in this case. What about the possibility of terrorism in Egypt? After all, uh, President Sadat was assassinated, uh, what, 12 years mm -hmm. ago. I is that a continuing possibility in Egypt, that sort of extremist violence? I think terror and terrorism will be with us for forever. It has always been there, and uh, political assassinations are, uh, in history have always been around, and uh, even in this country, in the United States of America, there are all kinds of uh, political terrorism, and presidents of the country died before at the, at the gunpoint. And, uh, so it is not really something that is typical of the Middle East or typical of today's situation or the result of today's activities in, in the political arena. So one cannot really take these kinds of uh, potential uh, terrors and uh, control your own geopolitical view based on what the terrorists would want you to do. So uh, yes, indeed, there are risks. And there has been terrorism in Egypt, but there has been political terrorism throughout history, everywhere in other countries. So I don't really think it is a matter to focus on present, uh, the present history of Egypt. Uh, Professor Shukri, do you agree with Professor El Baz's position that the, the government of is that the people of Israel, oh, uh, Israel of Egypt, overwhelmingly support the position of President Mubarak? Well, he has been in Egypt more recently than I. I haven't been there since June, uh, so I, I suspect he's right. Yes, I, I would agree with that. How much? Uh, certainly, there's been a great influx of refugees into Egypt. People coming back from the Gulf since August, mm -hmm. when the invasion happened. How, has that affected the political situation or the tone in Egypt? Are there a lot of unemployed people who are suddenly landed in the country? Indeed, that has caused a lot of economic mm -hmm. difficulty, but also has aroused uh, emotions in the country because yeah. Egyptians yeah. had been manning all of the fields in Iraq. I mean, to this day, there is mm -hmm. nearly a million Egyptians in Iraq, uh, mostly in the fields, uh, yeah. in agriculture. But also the, the fact that many Egyptians had to return, leaving behind their money, leaving behind their research centers and uh, the, I had many uh, friends that uh, were working in both in, uh, in Kuwait and in Iraq and uh, they all had returned right after the occupation of, uh, of Kuwait uh, distraught by what had happened and they lost their research, they lost their money, they lost their livelihood. So there are a lot of people in Egypt have, affi have been affected by the situation. Nonetheless, they, whatever happened is really a, a sad thing for the whole Arab world because no Arab would like to see another Arab 
die at the point of a gun by Arab armies. So there is, there is this discussion going on and there is thinking in Egypt about what is it that is being done and what for. So there, there is a, a great deal of uh, satisfaction at the fact that Egypt is taking a very strong stand, but there is also fear of what is it that is being done and what the Iraq is going to look like after the war. As I understand it, the universities and, and high schools in Egypt have all been suspended. They're still on their break and there's no end in sight when the students are going to be allowed to go back to classes. Why is that? Are, are, is the government really concerned about uh, student uh, unrest if, if classes resume? I think this is um, standard operating procedures. Uh, every time there is any sense of stress in the society, the government tends to uh, slow down the uh, re-enrollment and, and opening of schools. I, I'm not concerned about that. I think that's pretty standard. Looking at Jordan, uh, not very far away, uh, with all of the uh, political support that has developed uh, under the new political freedom in Jordan, in Parliament and in public opinion, you get a sense that conceivably King Hussein has been swept along by the tide of public opinion. How much freedom do people have in Egypt to express their ideas, just in terms of free speech and also in terms of freedom of the press? I think a great deal. There is uh, now in Egypt the uh, freedom of the press and freedom of expression. You can see people on television standing up and talking about the government position, whether they are supported or not. Yeah. And there is always uh, discussion. Actually, there had been a, uh, a, a 100 of the Egyptian uh, press uh, individuals that gathered in support of Iraq. This is naturally it's a, it's a small number because it is 100 out of 4,000 members of mm -hmm. the press corps. But nonetheless, those members of the press that would like to voice an opinion against the government yeah. position can do so freely. I think that uh, Cairo is, is a center for Islamic studies. Uh, to what, how much appeal does it make to, to Muslims in Egypt when someone like Saddam Hussein make, makes a call for, for a holy war against the Western coalition? I would say not terribly much. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, I would agree yeah. with uh, Dr. Shukri because the, even though the, the call has been told about jihad and so on, but really the uh, Muslim scholars have interpreted jihad as a war against the enemy of God, and therefore not everyone yeah. can just call upon uh, the masses or the people to uh, to for a jihad. Mm -hmm. But uh, and actually, uh, the the head of the Islamic uh, ulama in Saudi Arabia himself said that very recently. Said the jihad is the fight against the enemy of God, and because of what he has done, Saddam Hussein now is the enemy of God, and therefore it is a jihad to fight the forces of Saddam Hussein including those the, of the, the forces of the Muslims as well as non-Muslims. So it is the interpretation of the word jihad is, has been stretched very much. What is the position, Professor Shukri, of Egypt in the Arab world today? How much leadership and authority does Egypt have? And has Egypt ever regained the position that it had before Camp David? Oh, I uh, would put it the other way around. I think Egypt has never lost that position. I think it has shown stability. It has shown uh, being able to stay on course. And it has shown a certain amount of uh, very strong leadership. So I'm very optimistic on that score. But Professor Abbas, would you agree that Egypt never lost uh, that support from other Arab nations? Wasn't Egypt perceived as having made a separate peace and sort of selling mm -hmm. out the Arab cause with, with Israel? That's true as far as the political leadership mm -hmm. is concerned. And, and Egypt was, uh, was actually kept out of the political mm -hmm. discussion only. During the, uh, that time when Egypt was out of the fold, so to speak, the uh, Iraqis had been calling upon the Egyptian military industry to supply it with all the armament that it required during the war with Iran. And during that same time, there were many Egyptians manning the important posts in Saudi Arabia and then the Gulf states, and including Iraq. And so there, there was not, never really, a, Egypt was never out of the fold uh, on the public level, but only politically. We need to take a break here. However, we will continue our conversation about Egypt's role in the Gulf crisis in just a moment. Welcome back as we continue our conversation about Egypt's role in politics of the Middle East. My guests are Nazli Shukri and Farouk El Baz. Professor Shukri, one of the things that I, I have read and, and heard said quite recently during the Gulf mm -hmm. Crisis is that in the eyes of some Arabs, uh, President S Saddam Hussein of Iraq is, is achieving the kind of prominence that, that no leader of an Arab nation has had since the days of uh, President Nasser of Egypt back in the 1950s. How do you feel about that when people make comparisons between Saddam Hussein and Nasser? Not good. I think, <laughs> I think Nasser was a man of vision and a true leader and not a thug. And he never behaved really quite unpleasantly. 
I think Saddam Hussein's record is not terribly wonderful. I think the comparison is not terrific. Although I will add to that, though, the, the fact that uh, it is perceived that Saddam Hussein is a man that may have the guts to stand up and tell the yeah. whole world yes. no yes. or say yeah. that we don't we'll need you and we're going to do it on our own and this kind yeah. of uh, rhetoric. Actually, at the time of the beginning of the uh, of this uh, yeah. Gulf crisis, there was a lot of yeah. rhetoric that came from Baghdad that reminded me of what came from Egypt in 1967 or right before the Arab-Israeli War of 67. Very much the same kind of thing. So it is, it is perhaps true that uh, there is a great deal of difference between the two uh, personalities, but there is this, uh, this yeah. uh, attitude that he is a, a strong man that is coming to tell everybody Go to hell, I'm going to do it on my own. But you know, what he has done, uh, which, which Nasser had not done, and that is Saddam Hussein brought the entire world and every possible piece of equipment to the Middle East. Because and as it happened, the, the Cold War was over and the Soviets exactly. and the United States were exactly. no longer at odds. How, how much did Nasser's position back in, in the 50s benefit Egypt and, and the, the Arab world in general by, by the, the way that he manipulated the Cold War tensions? In one way, Nasser was really very good for the Arab world because he was the first one to stand up and uh, give that vision of mm -hmm. uh, that things will change if yeah. this whole world became united. An Arab world united would be something that is significant that the whole world will look up to and yeah. we will get our rights yeah. if we are united. The only thing that he did wrong was that he yeah. wanted to have this unity under him for himself. But uh, he certainly did a great deal of good. And uh, however, yeah. he also did a, a great deal of uh, mishaps in Egypt in the, uh, the economic situation and then dealing with the Eastern Bloc and then suffocating the economy of these kinds of things. Well, no, after he nationalized the Suez Canal, he pushed yeah. ahead with construction of the Aswan Dam. Yes. Uh, how much is his economic legacy still felt in, in God, Egypt today? It is. It really is still felt in Egypt despite the efforts to, to fix things. The problem with Nasser is, or the problem with thinking about Nasser, is that it's impossible to, to be neutral. Uh, one can find his very strong points and one can find many things about him that were thoroughly awful at the same time. What about the legacy of, of President Sadat, uh, who, who went to Camp David mm -hmm. and very courageously found peace with Israel? Uh, do you think that Anwar Sadat stands uh, as a figure of, of a man who very courageously worked for peace in the Middle East? Well, I personally believe that uh, President Anwar Sadat will be recognized, uh, not today, but maybe in a few decades, as one of the greatest leaders of, the, uh, of Egypt, because he also, like Nasser, had the vision and the imagination, and like Nasser, had the courage and the, mor the moral uh, courage to stick to his uh, own feelings and his ideas. And he also was intelligent enough to recognize the need to bring Egypt back economically. And the things that have happened to this day in Egypt are really things that were the, the seeds were planted during mm -hmm. Sadat's uh, time. That, so the, all of the improvements in the economy to this day are coming from Sadat's uh, imagination. However, the one thing that everybody faulted him as the fact that he became a little too uh, uh, single-handed in his uh, dealings near the end, and the fact that when he dealt with, his, with Israel, he never really pulled the Palestinians with him. But, you know, it's fair to say that uh, Egypt is very lucky, or was very lucky, to have had three remarkable leaders, uh, with, with Nasser, with Sadat, and now with Mubarak. It's, it's not a bad record think about it. Since Camp David, Egypt has benefited from enormous aid from the United States. Do you think there's any validity to the point of view that in one sense Egypt sold out to, to the West uh, and left uh, its uh, Arab friends behind? I don't think so at all because the, the, the economic aid to Egypt did not come after Camp David uh, uh, except after many years of the Camp yeah. David. Actually the, the peace dividend is yet to come to Egypt from uh, from the uh, days of uh, Camp David. I think the aid in the, uh, that uh, was given by the United States to Egypt was well worth it as a, a country that is stable, that is actually supporting the stability in the whole Middle East and recognition of the position of Egypt in the whole region. You know, we've talked about Egypt's role in the Middle East, but we haven't looked at the fact that Egypt I is a North African country, essentially. Uh, what is the nature of Egypt's relationship today with the other uh, Arab countries of North Africa? Good, good, solid. Uh, non-competitive. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good relationship. And yep. not only the Arab countries, mm -hmm. by the way. Egypt is is positioned in Africa. Does yeah. not limit itself to the Arab countries in Africa. Egypt has played a very solid role in African 
uh, affairs and Egypt was behind many of the very significant political moves in South Africa, for instance, the release of uh, Mandela and things like that. There is Egyptian uh, uh, activities behind all of that. And uh, also President Mubarak last year was the president of the African, the Organization of African Unity. Mm -hmm. So there is a big role for Egypt in Africa as a whole. Down through the centuries, there's been a certain jockeying of, of position for leadership in the Arab world among cities like Cairo or Damascus or Baghdad. Uh, are Egypt and, and Syria and Iraq all three of them natural rivals in some sense for leadership of the Arab world? This is a biased group here. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that it, it's not, not no rivalry there. <laughs> I would say Egypt is clear ahead on that one. Do you think there's a different point of view in Syria or in Iraq? All of these countries and all of these uh, cities uh, had uh, uh, a history of uh, greatness in one time or another. But in recent times, uh, Egypt has certainly been the leader because uh, Egypt had the universities, had the teachers, and was able to send the teachers out. And Egypt had the, the movie industry, the television industry. So the, the culture of the, the Arab world in present times yeah. really comes from Egyptian. Let me ask you one last question before we close here. How far is Egypt prepared to support United Nations coalition efforts against Iraq? Where would Egypt draw the line? If Israel got actively involved in the war or if the United States sent troops into Iraq, where would Egypt stop? In my scholarly opinion, it will depend on the extent of damage in Iraq. That is what I think will determine. And as, as soon as, as, uh, as, as uh, President Mubarak had said, Egypt is there to protect Saudi Arabia and to free Kuwait. So the Egyptian armed forces that are now mm -hmm. stationed on the lines will go into Kuwait to free Kuwait. But the Egyptian forces will not go into Iraq mm -hmm. to participate in any destruction within Iraq. Thank you both very much for being with us today. Good. Next, more about Islamic culture with art treasures from Kuwait.